This is The Daily Space for May 10th, 2018. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. Every weekday, we here at CosmoQuest work to bring you highlights of everything that is new and interesting in astronomy and space science. Catch us live here on Twitch every day at the same time, same bat channel, or subscribe to us over on the CosmoQuest channel on YouTube. Wherever you watch, we're here to help you get the space you need. And now for today's top story. This week, professional astronomers and citizen scientists from around the world are gathering in London to discuss results from the Juno Missions JunoCam. You may be familiar with some of the images from this mission as they highlight these amazing swirling patterns that we had previously never had high quality images of. They've also given us our first chance to see the polar regions of Jupiter and the amazing vortices that appear there. Now, what you may not know is JunoCam is not actually part of the Juno mission scientific payload. Rather, this is a camera that was added to allow everyday people, people just like you, to log on to the Juno mission website and become part of the mission by scheduling, voting for, and then acquiring their own images with JunoCam. We're also, as a community, asking amateur astronomers to take their own images of Jupiter and upload those to the system so that we can use those for planning purposes. Now, a couple of my favorite highlights coming out of today's meeting are the images that you see here. This particular composite image was created by Sean Duran in collaboration with other Juno team members. This is actually a composite of a whole variety of different images that were captured back in April and have been mosaic together to create this one amazing image. Now, if we look at a region of this image and zoom in, you see in the top right, that there is uh, this stormy image, but not all of the details are highly visible. Let's face it, Jupiter is in many ways just a whole lot of shades of gray, beige, and tan. Now, if you take these images and you process them to greatly bring out the contrast, to bring out the details in these spiraling structures without worrying about staying true to the colors, you get the image that you see on the bottom right. Now, uh, amateur astronomer Gerald Erstadt, a mathematician who works as a software developer, he took two of these images taken a few minutes apart and then worked in software to create the movie that I'm about to show you. Now, the first frame in this movie and the last frame in this movie are all created using actual images from JunoCam. The frames in between are all created using computer models and extrapolation. This gives us our first chance to get a detailed understanding of just how all of these different structures are moving and evolving over time in Jupiter's atmosphere. Now, not all of today's news comes from JunoCam. In fact, we have other amazing highlights from the Alma space from the Alma ground-based telescope down in the Atacama Desert in Chile. During a recent surveying run, a group of astronomers uh, led by S. E. Van Torsica at Leiden University found this disk that they hadn't previously known and weren't actually looking for. This particular disk is around a T-Tauri variable star. This is a large red type K6 star that's about 150 parsecs away in the direction of the constellation Lupus. This particular star is part of the Lupus star forming region. Now what's interesting here is as we look at the image, we see a series of bands of brightening and then decreasing luminosity. It might be easy to start off by thinking perhaps these dark gaps are where planets are forming, but this actually isn't the case. This is where in the future, perhaps if we're lucky, planets might form. But at this point in time, what we actually have is gaps that are located more than 100 AU away, more than 100 times the distance of the Earth from the Sun away from this still forming star. 
These gaps represent various lower density regions in the disk. They also represent places where the disk has slightly different opacities, different temperatures. And when we put all of these different factors together, the scientists are, are building a model that leads them to believe that what we're actually seeing is something of a step function in the structure of the disk. Now in the future, this is only a few million year old star, in the future, these different features that we're seeing today could evolve to be the places that planets form, could evolve to be the places where we see gravity allowing new structures to collapse. But today, this is just one of what we hope will be many snapshots that allow us to piece together a movie of how star systems form. This is a new piece that we didn't have before that was discovered uh, just by accident while looking for other things. And uh, now we know just how big these disks can come. Now, looking at even more complex disk systems, Astronomers from the Netherlands have uh, worked on modeling different ways that massive, what we call asymptotic giant branch stars in binary systems can interact with one another. These asymptotic giant branch stars are the results of massive stars, but not so massive that they initially go supernova, but stars that are bigger than our sun in mass evolving and expanding and evolving and expanding until they are stars like what you may know the Myra um, pulsating variable star. These massive stars have a wind that is generating mass loss. As this mass moves away from the stars, in binary systems it has the opportunity to be scooped up and made a part of the other star. This means that it's possible to have two asymptotic giant branch stars orbiting around each other. And as they orbit around each other, they're both giving off mass in their stellar winds, and this mass is transporting from one star to the other. Now, as this occurs, a couple of different things can happen. You can either have the mass transfer lead to the star system slowly evolving so that the stars move further and further apart, or you can have it occur in such a way that the stars slowly move closer and closer together until they become what's called a common envelope system. This is where the two stars get so close that their individual cores are heating both envelopes, creating a common envelope. This can actually lead to the merger of these two stars into a single star. Now, in order to understand exactly when these two different situations, the moving apart and the moving together, can occur, this team of scientists ran a variety of simulations looking at the effects of different orbital speeds, different orbital uh, separations, and at differences in the speeds of the winds. It turns out the two key issues are what is the terminal velocity of the wind between the stars and what is the orbital velocity between the two stars. If you have a high speed wind, this actually leads to those orbits expanding and you have very little uh, Angular momentum loss. Angular momentum is what allows ice skaters to change their rate of rotation by expanding their arms and contracting them. If you are able to essentially expand the arms on a star, and I'll explain how that happens in a moment, you can actually slow down the rotation of the stars and change how the system moves. Now, in a low wind situation, that low speed wind as it moves to the other star is actually able to build an accretion disk. Here's where you imagine our, our ice skater putting their arms out. And as that, accre that uh, accretion disk forms, you end up with significant angular mass loss in the stars. And this causes the orbits of the stars to shrink together. Now, we still don't fully understand how common these two different situations are, but we at least are beginning to understand the processes that matter. What's cool is with this common envelope phase, it's possible that 
uh, rather than becoming a single star, what you can actually end up happening is having significant mass transfer that leaves behind a white dwarf star that can later go ahead and cannibalize mass off of that other star and blow up in a type 1a supernova. So finding new ways to create or better defining known ways to create these type 1a uh, standard candles that we use to measure distances throughout our universe. This is always cool science. So today there hasn't been a lot of news. We're getting late in the week. Uh, most news comes out early. So Things are a little bit quiet, but the science is still kind of amazing. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, if you'd like to catch more, tune in tomorrow, or we have another show running this evening, starting at 9 p.m. Eastern, which is 6 p.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. Friday in Australia, we are going to be having our second episode of our Learning Space series. Each week, Learning Space brings you a new guest, brings you highlights from the news. Uh, tonight, we're going to do a deep dive into the results of the Gaia mission, and then we review some product, some program, some way that you can get involved in science. Tonight, our special guest is Richard Saunders, who is an Australian skeptic who uses his, uh, well, his work as an actor, a magician, and an origami expert to help teach people critical thinking, problem solving, and the importance of having a scientific outlook on how we view our day-to-day -day lives. So join me, Dr. Pamela Gay, tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. tomorrow in Sydney, Australia, right here on CosmoQuest X, here on Twitch, and get all sorts of new ways to get science into your head. So thank you. This has been Daily Space for May 10th. I will now take your questions over in the chat once I find where that window went. Uh, so I see Larry uh, uh, confusing me. Um, Larry, I'll follow up what that meant later. Thank you, Phoenix, for the comment. Um, so, so Larry's asking, what's an asymptotic giant branch star? Um, <laughs> That's that's a star that is burning uh, a helium shell around its nucleus, a hydrogen shell around that, and is the last throes of a mid-mass star uh, before it gives off its atmosphere and settles down to being a white dwarf. Um, so the guest tonight is Richard Saunders. I see that Susie stuck it in the chat. Do we have any other questions out there? So if you like the show, give us a follow. Follows are free. If you want to sustain the show, your subscriptions and your bits, make it possible for us to bring this to you every weekday. Uh, this project is a not for pr profit project run out of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, headquartered out in San Francisco with offices here in Edwardsville, Illinois, as well as having staff and offices scattered in all sorts of places in countries circling the Pacific. Uh, yeah, it's AGB just like that. So it's ASIM, oh, I may misspell this, asymptotic giant branch star. Uh, I always misspell asymptotic. Let's see if, if that got it. Okay. Do we have any other questions out there? And Richard is also a magician and an actor, Paranor. Um, he does all sorts of different things. The upper right is hard to read. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Hi, Andrew. Um, the Earth is not falling into the sun. Actually, one of the cool things that's going on 
is as our sun is itself losing mass, just like the asymptotic giant branch stars I was talking about, but the sun is doing this at a much lower rate. As our sun is losing mass at a very, very low rate, the earth is migrating away away from the sun, also at a very, very low rate. While this doesn't matter now or for the next several thousand years, it does matter far in the future. As our sun stops burning hydrogen in its core, it's going to expand out. And when this expansion occurs, mass loss will have allowed the Earth to have migrated just far enough away from the sun that we don't get it consumed during this expansion. Uh, so no, this isn't thing, something that we need to worry about. Um, so other things. Uh, is there, so I see from St. Just Germany, is there a known reason why we have galaxy filaments and voids? So with, with galaxy filaments and voids, this is the large scale structure of our universe. Uh, we actually do have a pretty good understanding of where these originated. Back before the um, universe fully became transparent, we had such a hot, dense universe that photons couldn't even travel further than just a couple atoms away from where they were emitted. During this time, we could actually get effectively sound waves echoing through space. And these sound waves generated places where the material was slightly more dense and was slightly less dense. The places that were more dense when the universe finally became transparent, when the cosmic microwave background was formed, those echoes of these slight overdensities stayed there. And in the first days of the universe, we were still smaller, we were still denser, and we saw the first stars beginning where these highest overdensities were, the first galaxies forming where the highest overdensities were. And these initial structures, these initial overdensities of mass exerted their gravitational pull on everything around them. And so they pulled things towards them, creating these super clusters and walls. And while they did this, they emptied out the voids that were found between the largest density areas. We actually have computer models that can very nicely simulate the universe that we see today. Uh, so white holes mathematically exist, but the problem is if you read through a lot of the more commonly accepted theories for white, for, uh, white holes, and there, there's many theories out there and not all of them are commonly accepted. The more commonly accepted ones say that a white hole will collapse the second energy or mass enters it. Since our universe is permeated with the photons from the cosmic microwave background, it doesn't seem that it would be possible for a white hole to be stable and to exist. So as far as we know, they're not out there. I see Andrew asking, have I read The Three-Body Problem by Kaixin Liu? Uh, yes, I read it. It is a fabulous series that I recommend for everyone out there. It's super weird and there's no way for me to describe it um, other than to say it's awesome and super weird. Uh, so go ahead and uh, give it a read. I can't say anything more without spoilers. Uh, I see Larry asking, was the Big Bang a white hole? Uh, no idea. Uh, probably not. That, that really doesn't make sense with our understanding of physics. But at the same time, our ability to understand the universe kind of ends um, fragments of a second uh, after the Big Bang started. So yeah, we don't really understand that initial thing that became our universe. Uh, no science. <laughs> so are there other questions out there? Um, so I see St. Just Germany asking, what do you think about dark matter theory? Dark matter is matter from parallel universe. Now, as, as near as we can tell, dark matter is just like regular everyday stuff, but 
unlike my phone and my own particles in my body, uh, the particles in dark matter don't uh, interact with photons. So right now, sunlight coming in through my window is bouncing off my body into my camera, allowing you to see me. It's bouncing off the walls onto my body into the camera, allowing you to see me. This interaction with photons is mediated through the electromagnetic force, allowing us to see things. Uh, it's also allowing chemical bonds to take place that allow my phone to be held together. All of these things that are made possible thanks to the electromagnetic force. Well, dark matter's like, nope, not going to go there, not going to do it. But we know of stuff that does that. Uh, neutrinos really hate to interact. And we don't think the number of neutrinos in the universe is anywhere near enough to amount for all of the dark matter that's out there. But we do think it's stuff similar to neutrinos that has similar characteristics in many ways that is what makes up dark matter. So it's just stuff that hates the electromagnetic force. Um, yes, Planck time is, is what I was alluding to, Larry. Uh, so Icarus Factor is asking what is affected by the Hubble constant and what is not. So the, the Hubble constant is that rate at which our universe is expanding at this moment, H naught. Now, we now know, thanks to discoveries made back in 1998, that the rate of our universe's expansion is changing with time. And we pretty much knew that before, but we weren't certain. And now we know. What this expansion of the universe means is that things that aren't held together by other factors, they aren't held together by gravity, they aren't held together by the electromagnetic force, they aren't molecules and atoms that are held together via the strong and the weak force. Anything that's just kind of hanging out there in space is going to get carried away with the flow of the universe as it expands. So when we look out, what we'll often see actually is things that are kind of in this intermediate state. So we might see two galaxies that are loosely gravitationally attracted, but that gravitational attraction isn't enough to prevent them from being carried apart. And so they're getting carried apart slower than the universe is expanding, but they're still getting carried apart and as they get further and further apart, they'll move more and more at the Hubble constant at the expansion rate of the universe. As we look over the greatest distances, we th see things that are truly being carried away at the expansion rate of the universe. See Larry asking if I prefer astronomer or astrophysicist. I'm very much an observational astronomer and a software developer. Astrophysicists are people who are working more in high energy astronomy, uh, who are working more in particle physics side of astronomy, uh, those two are very closely related, and people who are doing a lot more theoretical work than what I do. Uh, I'm just a girl who likes to use a telescope or preferably data that already exists in a database that I don't have to worry about uh, fighting clouds to get. Um, so Phoenix is asking, did you see the article on astronomy.com about the red? No, I did not see that. Um, drop me a link and maybe I can line it up for tomorrow's episode of Daily Space. Um, Saint Just Germany asks, what is the biggest distance for quantum entanglement? Um, so, so to back this up, quantum entanglement is the idea that if you have two particles, and I'm trying to find two identical things on my desk, and I have chopsticks, and conveniently my chopsticks have little heads on them. Um, so if I have two particles that are released from the same, let me try and get this both on camera. So if I have two particles that are released uh, from the same interaction, they will work to conserve properties. So one will be spin up when the other is spin down. If they flip, they both flip. And what we can see when we look at these particles through different detectors is as they move apart, their values stay constant. There have been a variety of different experiments done at increasing and increasing and increasing distances that show that this is an instantaneous transition. 
And it appears that the wave function of the two particles is able to instantaneously change across the entire wave, allowing these connected particles to, well, get information at faster than the speed of light, by which I mean instantaneously between the two of them. Um, I don't know the greatest distance that this has been verified for. There was a paper that came out either earlier this week or last week that I, I don't think is going to hold up under future uh, experiments that was trying to say that these most likely, um, the results are most likely uh, going to get invalidated, where they tried to say that quantum entanglement isn't a thing. Um, I know that they've done this over vast distances between countries in Europe. Um, I don't know the exact distance. Uh, okay. Yes, I have chop forks. I admit I've, I've never used the forky bit as a forky bit. Um, mostly it just makes it easier to not lose them through the bottom of the dishwasher. Um, yes, Larry, you should be able to post a link. Um, so Guido, we're gonna we're going to post this up on YouTube. You'll be able to catch it there. Um, my my work office needs many things. Um, so yes, that is um, an article on this, but I don't know how old that article is. Yeah, so this is a June 2017 article, so I'm not sure if that's still the record holder. Um, okay, other, other questions. If there aren't other questions, I'm going to get back to, well, making some science here um, from our offices of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific in Southern Illinois. You can be part of everything we do by, well, you can join the Weekly Space Hangout crew uh, whose, whose link was just posted in the chat. Um, oh, uh, oh, there's more questions coming in. Um, so uh, St. Just Germany. Ah, oh, you're inspiring me to do questions shows. I do actually spend Tuesday nights answering questions here on this channel during my office hours. Uh, those are at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, so the whole universe is probably not inside of a black hole. That would be super weird. Um, but if you have a sufficiently large black hole, it's possible that you could pass through the event horizon, that point at which in order to escape back out, you have to be going faster than the speed of light. It would be possible with a sufficiently massive black hole to go through the event horizon and not even notice. So you can live in that space between where tidal forces destroy you and the outer uh, event horizon and yeah live um, I'm not sure it would be a good life um, so so thank you all for sharing um, I hope to see many of you tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Friday in Sydney for our next episode of Learning Space. Uh, tomorrow I will be back, same back time, same bat channel to bring you more of Daily Space. If you like what you see, give us a follow. Follows are free. If you want to keep what we're doing going into the future, uh, your subscriptions sustain our programs. Thank you very much for joining me. Anna, I'll see you all on the other side. <laughs> bye bye. Have a great morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you may be in the world.